going on, Wolves and Warriors? My name's Jay Stewart, and this is the Better Body Academy podcast, the number one show for those looking to permanently overhaul their mind and body without dumb diets and unsustainable workout programs. We banish the fitness industry BS and replace it with science-backed strategies proven through countless client transformations. In the Better Body Academy, we help busy men and women around the world get unstuck and back into momentum so they start feeling strong and sexy again. Our mission is to transform one million lives and you, my friend, could be next. And on that note, let's get straight into today's show. Welcome back to the Better Body Academy podcast, the podcast that you come to when you're sick of the dumb diets and unsustainable workout programs. And today I have a special, special guest. I, I, can't, I hate saying my lady because it makes it sound possessive. Just say Cordia. Just, we've got Coach Cordia here and uh, my beautiful fiance here. And we're going to be talking about this whole idea of becoming healthy mm-hmm. when you're a parent. And it's a really, really kind of challenging subject particularly if you're a new parent and so we're going to flog this one out a little bit um what i do want to say is before we get started super super stoked and excited to be kicking off our uh, various masterminds next week for our advanced clients and students Mm -hmm. super pumped we've been working on them for the last few days and uh it's going to continue over the course of the next few days so amped to get involved with you guys all right so let's set the scene so uh you become a mum near on 12 months ago. Yeah, almost. She's almost a year. Almost yeah. a year old. Um, and so let's talk about the typical struggles which can kind of happen when you become a parent and all of a sudden you kind of sleep deprived, mm-hmm. dealing with challenges. So maybe from your experience, what have you found? Um, well, it's definitely something, and as I know many parents can probably relate, that when you have your first child, it isn't anything that you can ever prepare for. Mm. Like we did all the prenatal classes, but until you, you know, we have the fake doll or we didn't even (laughs) have the fake doll. We had a towel like as a pretend baby to dress up or whatever. But until you actually have the baby, you can't really practice for it. And so I think it's just one of those things that it's really unknown and being an aunt or uncle, it's not the same Mm. as actually having your own Mm. child. Because I think oftentimes when you, are an aunt and uncle, you see the child when they're having fun and yeah, yeah. when they start to cry or when there's an issue, you're kind of like, okay, I'm done with playing with you. And an hour or two is done and you're not dealing with the baby yeah. 24 seven, which is something that you just can't practice. It happens. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden you're smacked with like, you're tired, your time yeah. goes down. And yeah. then particularly for a woman recovering from either vaginal birth, I oh know, sorry, you always told me that's the wrong way to say it, natural birth, I should say, or surgery, it mm-hmm. becomes like, physically difficult as well right yeah no exactly like you can't move around and do the things that you're used to right away and there's just a lot of things to adapt to all of a sudden there's this little being Mm. this life that you that really depends on you all of a sudden Mm. yeah totally and I think uh, I I want you to give me kind of like a silent head nod if you're listening to the pod or you're watching live and and you've adjusted to that or or you've become you experience what we're talking about here so you become a parent and you're like (laughs) Yes, I understand the difficulties I've had. And so we have particularly a bunch of women mm-hmm. uh, inside our academy. What, what percentage of the women do you reckon are mums? Maybe like two thirds? Yeah, two, th- two thirds. I think, every, yeah, there's a lot of women in the group and whether it's a, a younger child, mm. like close to Ocean's age or an older child, there are a lot of mums in our group just because most of the people in the Better Body Academy in terms mm. of the women's group right now mm. are probably 30 and over. 30 and over, Mainly, yeah. I think 90% are 30 and over. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Mm. And so talk me through, like, obviously you you become a mum and there was the, the challenges that obviously happened to your body, but what else do you think is kind of going on in that first maybe like three to six months like and, and obviously you've discussed it with a lot of our female clients like what do you see is happening that that is a repeating theme um, um, I think what happens well in this I can only speak from my personal experience I know mm-hmm. everyone has their own experience about entering motherhood or a parenthood because mm-hmm. it's not just I don't think it's just women I think it's for men as well yeah definitely but all of a sudden you take the focus off of yourself mm-hmm. and everything suddenly becomes about the baby. And Mm. I think even for some relationships, you know, there's been times where I'm like, I almost didn't have time for you. Mm. And just as important as it 
is for me to have time for me. It's important for me to have time for my partner mm. and that everything doesn't actually always become about the baby. Mm. Um, but I think that's what happens to a lot of us is all of a sudden, because it's so new, because we don't know how to do it, because there hasn't been practice, we feel like if we don't put all our energy, all our eggs into the baby, that the baby's not going to be brought up mm. in a healthy or a great environment. I think that's mm. kind of what, mm. you know, all of a sudden I just felt like everything was about the baby. And even just um, for us in our birth, our experience of bringing baby ocean into the world is it was completely unexpected. Mm. Um, we had to have an emergency C-section. I had no idea what that was going to be like, what the recovery was going to be like. Um, and even still, like as I was recovering, I remember being, and then of course she was in the NICU for a couple of weeks mm. that I remember even when she was crying and the nurses were saying, you know, you need to rest, please don't get up. We're here for this reason so that you don't have to get up and, you know, feed her um, because right now she's going to be, you know, having uh, don donor milk because your milk hasn't come in. Mm. So there's no need for you to get up that it's hard for a mom, especially it's your instinct yeah. that the second she cried, even though the nurses had said, don't worry about it, mm. that I would get up because all of a sudden I feel like as a mom, you just suddenly be like, I need to be there. So you, so you kind child. of, it's almost like you're in reaction mode constantly and you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're yeah, dealing exactly. with like the little spot flyers as they come up. Exactly. And because you don't know what every single cry is when they first mm. come out. And mm. so I think anytime I heard a cry, I would immediately stop and drop whatever I was doing yeah. and run to be with her. And I think most moms are like that. And I think that's just Mm. you know, that natural instinct for their survival. Mm. Mm. Yeah, totally. And one of the things that probably doesn't get discussed a hell of a lot, in, at least in the public space, mm. is that the, the mental side or the psychological side of becoming a mum, particularly post-delivery, um, I don't know if you can really speak firsthand, but just some of the experiences that some women can have, which put them on the back seat in terms of looking after themselves. So like, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, postnatal anxiety or depression. Yeah. Depression. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing that I experienced. So I can't speak for that, but I know that is something that can happen. And I mm. think the nurses say, you know, look out for these signs and it, when you do feel those signs, talk about it. It's, it's, it's okay to have conversations, but, but I can't speak about that. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we wanted to do in, uh, in this discussion is really just talk a little bit more about, um, the kind of lens that we can look at this through now, um, just with parenting, there's no right or wrong way to deal with the things that are the, the obstacles that are coming in the early years of becoming a parent. Um, and we've certainly had our difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and so how has your, say, like your health routine or well-being changed in the last year compared to before you were pregnant? Well, I think initially, like you said, because we didn't really know what it was going to be like and there's no rehearsal for having a baby. Mm everything was about ocean when mm. she was born. And for the first, you know, three to four, I guess maybe three to five months, everything was about her. Mm. And I basically, you know, did the whole mom thing, which, you know, no sleep and was okay with that. And mm. basically stopped taking care of myself. Actually, if I really? had to sum it up is, mm. you know, I knew I wasn't ready to work out physically mm. and mentally because I was tired. Mm. Um, you know, the, my focus was on her mm. Physically, I couldn't because I had a C-section. So the recovery there is probably, I don't know what the recovery light is like when you have a natural birth, but for me, it was very difficult to move and to walk and to get up. Mm. And so I wasn't going to push myself to the point where it would cause an injury mm. Mm. Um, when I wasn't physically ready. And so for a while, it's okay. You listen to your body and you listen to yourself and you go with your gut. And when it, that was the case, you know, it was okay for not, for you not to return to for me not to return to working out, mm. being active, um, and taking care of myself, I guess, in that way, um, for the first couple of months, I kind of gave myself some slack because of what we had gone through. And I think that's completely normal yeah, yeah. for a lot of moms and recommended. <laughs> yeah. And recommended exactly. Yeah, yeah. By no means are we advocating because we're all about, you know, mm. health and everything that you start to work out and you start to, you know, eat healthier or, you know, not eat healthier, but just, uh, mm. you know, mm. following through with a plan. Um, right after having a baby, because I just, I do not recommend that. But for me, what happened is, you know, four, five, six months come along. Mm -hmm. And I realize now that I physically was able to go be more active. And mentally, I was in a really good place. We've gotten into a routine. And I think by six months, most parents have an idea of what's going on now. Mm -hmm. Sleep is sort of getting better. 
um, you're kind of getting used to that sleep deprivation, that you're in a bit more of a routine. But what happened to me is that I realized that I was actually now making excuses mm. and it wasn't actually legitimate physical um, barriers, Limit, limitations, limitations yeah, yeah. to me working out. And yeah. so, how, so how many, like, do you think it's a, uh, a problem that we try to take our old routines and situations have completely changed, but we try to make our old routines fit with our new life? Yeah. Do you think that's a problem? I don't think that's a problem, but I think it's a, an expectation that we should not put on ourselves mm. because there is this other being that is very unpredictable mm. that has now entered our lives. That is obviously a priority, mm. but I think what you do want to continue to do, which was there before you had the baby was that you were your own priority, mm. your health, whatever you were taking care of you. Mm. And then we have, well, the let's, baby. Let, let's go into that. Yeah. You being your own priority in a second. But I do remember getting to a point where, for example, I'd always trained in the morning and I always mm -hmm. trained at six o'clock in the morning. And that was the first thing I did when I get up. Mm -hmm. And then what was happening is that when we had a kid, I was trying to do the same thing, but with this whole like new priority in our life. And so it was causing me personally a whole lot of angst mm -hmm. and frustration that I couldn't go to the gym at six o'clock anymore. And so it was almost, ah, oh, fuck, I can't go to the gym anymore. So I might as well not go. And it, and so what mm. happened in a time of transition, I had no compassion for myself. Mm. Did you feel any of that along the way where you were trying to force old routines into almost like trying to put a square peg into a round hole? No, I feel like that was something that you experienced yeah. more because you're a man of routine yeah, true. and you're a man of doing the same things. And you've been recently more open to exploring mm. Other, that's true <laughs> you've, been, you've always been a man of routine yeah and I've always just kind of gone with the flow yeah so I don't think that really impacted me as much and I was kind of like okay well I just have to be adapting to mm. her now but that doesn't mean I can't adapt and still do the things and it's mm. it's just juggling everything that probably is the biggest challenge for a lot of women mm. and in the juggling it's almost like it seems so hard mm. that we almost would rather not juggle and try and make it work and just mm. Let's just focus on what we need to do, which is the so, baby. So how much of this is caused by the expectations that we put upon ourselves to kind of be at a certain place after pregnancy, look a certain way after pregnancy? Like how much of that, that our own angst is caused by a certain expectation? Of I think a lot of it, mm. you know, and especially like I'm a smaller framed woman. Um, for me, I think that pressure was from a lot of people saying, oh, you're going to bounce back so quickly. Mm. You're going to bounce back. And so I felt like I had to live up to that story mm. or that expectation that wasn't mm. actually something I put on myself, but yeah. from external factors or from other people saying that, that I was like, well, I should be bouncing back right mm. away. And I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the reason that got me back on, on no. my feet. No, but I can imagine it would be cause a lot of anxiety for someone, let's just say their healing wasn't as quick mm -hmm. or they had some mental trauma mm -hmm. or, or any number of things or the, or the something that the baby wasn't doing, wasn't settling. The baby was sick. Mm -hmm. The baby was in it. It could cause a lot of stress between hang on, like I'm six months on from, from being a mum here. Why hasn't things worked out for me? That must be really, really difficult, particularly for a woman to become accustomed to or, or mm -hmm. deal with. But you know what? I think at the end of the day, everyone's on their own journey and mm. everyone's pregnancy is different. Everyone's birth and delivery is different. And everyone's, you know, postpartum um, experience is also different. But I think um, what is consistent is that is how you handle it and how you deal with mm, it. Mm. Because how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah, right. That's a good point. And so I think, you know, there is no specific time as to when you should get back. It's when you feel right. And I think the thing that we may miss is when we're just making excuses now mm. from when we were maybe, you know, six months pregnant, or I mean, sorry, six months postpartum. And now it's now a year and a half later, mm. and we're still making the same excuse. And I think that's when you have to check in with yourself and ask, am I making excuses now to do, to be active or to be more mindful about my health? Or am I really, you know, going with what I feel is right? Because my body, like I said, yeah. isn't ready to do. And I'm mentally not ready. So, so let's talk about that. You mentioned, I really like the way you put it. Um, you've got to become your own priority again. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a bit about that? Like what, what do you think women do? And I know that like in any of this, Cordia, you probably can see she's very cautious about trying to speak on behalf of women. And so I'll put a, mm -hmm. pre -requ a, a, a qualifier in here. That's not what she's trying to do. But what do you think? happens 
how, how do you think it is that obviously baby becomes the priority and yeah. the woman kind of loses herself in the process? Yeah. And I think this is a common story yes. that we hear. Yeah. And so it's not a generalization. It's just common that we hear from the applications that we get from women who have had children and that are freshly new moms, or maybe their children are still quite young, that it's very difficult to put yourself first mm. um, because there's that guilt that if I take time off from, you know, being available for my family, mm. that that just isn't right or that's not fair. Mm. But I think it's actually not fair to yourself to not make yourself a priority mm. because now that you are a mom, you have someone that is looking up to you. You have someone who depends on you. Mm. And if you can't show up for yourself, this is how I see things, is if you can't show up for yourself, how can you show up for other people? Mm. In addition to that, they are looking up to us. Like she looks as a, at us and now that she's almost a year old, we see how much she copies what we do mm. when we all think they're so young, they don't know or they can't really, they're not processing what's going on, but mm. she sees what we're doing. And now she knows that, you know, she sees the things that we eat. Mm. Um, luckily, because becoming a parent has made me mm. more mindful about the things I feed her to ensure that she's kind of getting good nutrition. And because mm. we eat this way, that she eats the same things mm. that we, and we're kind of putting that um, mm, totally to on her early. So, know. so in terms of um, what impact would you say? Because I think you know, from knowing you before you were a mom, of course, mm -hmm. and knowing you after you're a mom, I think you're actually healthier and more balanced and, and more active actually mm -hmm. since becoming a mom mm -hmm. so how has that possibly happened yeah I think this is the thing that a lot of moms think is not possible but I think I've said this to you a few times before I was like I cannot believe the number of steps that I get in now mm. that I'm a mom mm. because first of all I can't be cooped up in our house all day mm. So, and I don't know what to do. With shout, out, shout out to our friends back in lockdown. <laughs> so, no, but even if you're in lockdown, you're able to go outside. You're not locked yeah. out from going for a walk with your kids, mm. but I don't know what to do with her for four hours sometimes inside the house. Mm. And so for me, I go on walks with her and cause I know she loves it. Mm -hmm. um, we both get fresh air. It's good for me. And I feel like this is perfect. Like as a mom, I get to go on walks all the time. Mm -hmm. I have an excuse to go on a walk. I have a reason to go on a walk. Mm -hmm. And usually those walks are like, 45 minutes to an hour. And for me, I guess I mindfully walk at a moderate pace mm. because I know I can get my heart rate up and get a workout in at the same time, mm. but I can easily cover 10,000 steps. And I know a lot of the moms in our group would be covering 15 to 18 yeah. to 20,000 steps on day because they're out walking their baby. When we did that, child. when we did the step challenge a, yeah. a couple of months ago, we were like, someone's nailed 20,000 steps yeah. before 10 o'clock. We're like, what the hell? How are you doing this? So, yeah. yeah. So I think being mom, you have, you know, this is a way that you, you're not like, this doesn't make me feel guilty because I'm taking the child with me. But even still, I think that's the hardest thing is that mom guilt is the worst. Mm. And, but I think if you just reframe it and look at it as your child or your children, your family, mm. yes, they depend on you and they look up to you and they need you, mm. but they need you to be your best version. Yeah. You need to be the best version of yourself so that you can give them the best experience, mm. you know, mm. and in, in terms of, in terms of working out aside from the cardio element, mm -hmm. do you think there is a, some extra stuff that has helped along the way? Um, yeah. So I guess in terms of like it becoming more healthy as a mom, there's obviously the steps because you go on more walks, you go to the park, you go do more things than just staying around and sitting at home all day. Mm. Um, but I've also had to become more efficient, I guess, with my time when I do a workout. Mm. Um, and so one thing is when she's taking a nap, I'm already in my gym gear when I get up. Mm. So I'm ready to go for a walk and I'm ready to go for a home workout mm. the second she takes a nap, because as I'm sure all moms know, Sometimes the naps are 30 minutes, 40 minutes, that sleep cycle, or sometimes they're an hour and a half and you mm. never know. So I can't just dilly dally around the second she goes down. It's literally put her down, mm. make sure she's good, mm. run downstairs and get the workout on with the monitor mm. um, in front of me. So that has made me more efficient with my time rather than just being like, let me just go scroll through my phone. Yeah. Um, and then mm. as well, we go to the gym sometimes, but we're paying for a nanny. Mm. Or we're asking my sister or we're asking my mom, we're asking someone mm. to watch her. So I know that I don't want to take advantage of their time because everyone's mm. time is precious that when we have someone watching her, whether we're paying them or someone like my a family member mm. is we know that the second mm. they're watching her, we got to go and do the things we got to do. And so you know, become more efficient. That's a really good point you raised about the, about the, uh, being really super onto it with your time because, mm. um, it, you know, I think a lot of us think we just got no time, but then if you actually did like a, 
like a time study over the course mm-hmm. of your day, how much of it was aimlessly scrolling? How much of it was just kind of pottering and doing nothing? And I'm not, there's no suggestion of lazy there. It's just a lack of awareness that, hey, you know what? You've got 20 minutes here as a little thing that you could just crack into a little body weight workout at home, yeah. just get a little bit of a sweat up. And I think what we do is we kind of, we aim for perfect and then mm-hmm. when perfect is unachievable, we, just we feel like a failure. Yeah, but that's not taking any action at all. Yeah. And not taking any action is actually worse than taking some action. And even yeah. if it's a 20 minute workout, as opposed to a 45 minute workout, yeah. at least I started moving my body and was able to do, you know, a little bit of a thing. But speaking of time, I'm just going to quickly tell a quick story about time and why we feel like, you know, even that time is actually an excuse. Um, so for a lot of us who are in lockdown, and I'm sharing this right now because some people are still in it. And perhaps you can change the way you use your time when you're in lockdown Mm. is that for us, we were in lockdown for a really long time. Mm. And how many of you during lockdown said you were going to clear out your closet, um, maybe, you know, go organize your Tupperware drawer, whatever you said you were going to do, because those are things that you never had time for before. Mm. And then now that lockdowns happen, there's less social activities. You're not going out for dinner. You're not commuting to work. You have all this extra time um, that you're like, perfect. This is great. Now I can actually go and work on this book that I've been meaning to write. Whatever your thing was that your excuse was time before um, that you didn't do. A lot of people said, I'm going to do this during lockdown because I can't do anything. Fast forward six, nine months. Lockdown for most of the world is now over. And even for those of you who have experienced lockdown the first time, how many of us actually went and accomplished the things that we said we were going to do because we now had time? Mm. Really, time is not the, the excuse. It's not. I think right? a lot of people, what, what happens is we get in our mindset when we're in lockdown. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, this sucks, sucks so much. And we spend all our time telling each other how much it sucks instead of actually doing something practical with it. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, that's just as little. Okay. (laughs) I like it. And, and so let's jump to the other side. So, and, and particularly for like weight management, I think this is where people that say I've got no time, which is fresh parents. Mm -hmm. I have no time. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're largely thinking that the answer to managing your weight lies in doing so much more exercise. Yeah. And I think that's a, this is such a misunderstanding, right? Yeah. Do you want to explain on that? Yeah. And a lot of people are like, I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time to this. I don't have time to that. It's just moving your body. And it's all right for you. You got a babysitter, right? Like you, you, we don't have that time. Let's talk about the weight management element Mm -hmm. to this about training versus nutrition Yeah, and the role that nutrition plays. Well, I think we've talked about this before, but in one of the posts I've made is that you can't outrun a bad diet. Mm. So it's not about how many times I can go to the gym. It's not about number of runs or the things that I can do that's going to help me to become healthier, shed the extra pounds mm-hmm. that I have on. Because really the reality is when you go to the gym, even if it's a 45, 50 minute session, um, even if you are productive, like you said, I think you brought this to my attention is that the amount of calories that you're actually burning from lifting weights is what maybe three four hundred? Yeah. Not maybe not even not that even. Many. Yeah, for from a for just an average lifting yeah. session where there's no cardio included, probably a hundred hundred fifty. It's not very many calories, and like even if you are going for a run, it may be three four hundred, but it's not significant enough to still eat whatever you want. No, well, to put it into actual numbers, if you uh, if you were doing your your uh, gym based workout. And the intention is mm. to build, to burn some fat off, right? That you might burn through 100, 150 calories. Mm. But if you took one of those big ass Starbucks lattes that, that we mm. keep drinking, made on full cream milk, mm. and you downsize it that to- we aren't drinking. That we, oh. No, but I'm saying that the world is drinking. <laughs> and you go from that to say an almond latte, or, or you go to a skim milk latte, you just save yourself somewhere in the vicinity of 200 calories, Mm -hmm. which is a simple change that didn't require any more time, any more money, Mm -hmm. no more planning, Mm -hmm. but you just saved yourself 200 calories Mm -hmm. versus trying to get to the gym, trying to find a babysitter, all the stress for for hundred calories. Yeah. So I know what you're saying. It's not about the, it's, it's not about the number of times you can get to the gym or go for a run. If you can move your body. And like I said, becoming a mom has made me move my body more in terms of the number of steps, Mm. which I was never even getting close to crushing Mm. before because I sit in front of a computer and I work all day that I didn't really need to get up and go for a walk. Um, But becoming a mom has helped to increase my steps. Mm -hmm. But also the second thing that it's helped me become is healthier in terms of the things that we're eating. 
um, you know, after, because now, now that I'm feeding a child milk that I am producing mm. from my body, essentially I became more aware of the things that I was consuming, knowing that what I was eating was feeding her. Mm. And that's just initially when I was breastfeeding. So I was very aware to ensure that I had a balanced diet and that I was feeding myself in a way that helped fuel me and mm. made me feel energized and made me feel healthy because essentially whatever I was intaking was going to be passed on to her. Mm. Um, fast forward to six, seven months when she started eating solids, um, you know, I was following this uh, account, which I talk about all the time at, at solid start. <laughs> if anyone is doing baby led weaning, uh, but I didn't really want to be having a picky eater because I've seen some picky eaters around and I was, it, it is challenging, right? Um, she's starting to become a little bit pickier and she knows what's sweet and what isn't, but I really wanted to make an effort to try and give her a variety of foods and to have a balanced diet. And mm. the last thing I wanted to actually um, have or to do was to make a separate, separate dinner meals. for yeah. her because that takes extra time. Yeah. So again, what I wanted to do was make one meal for the whole family that she could eat and I could eat. Because I think for some people, when we start a journey like this, we feel like, oh, now I have to create a separate meal for me because I'm trying to be healthy and my kids won't eat this. But it's not only that, it's the partner as well. So I spoke to mm -hmm. a gentleman through the week and the, the biggest hesitation that he had, he, it was, he said, so what's the diet? Because I, because my missus isn't going to support me if she has to eat one set of food and I have to eat the other. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not viable to mm -hmm. do that. And mm -hmm. so all this extra time in exercise and nutrition comes when you are doing things that aren't sustainable over the longer term. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk to us about like some, maybe some family friendly type meals that we can put together that are relatively simple. Um, and, and if you brought your kid up to be a little bit kind of exploratory with eating or mm -hmm. they're not as fussy. Yeah. Well, I think it can, healthy eating is simple eating mm. and that made it easier because we have a child. Mm. And so we've had to keep things simple for her because she's, I'm not going to make up some elaborate meal for her with all these different ingredients and sauces. Cause she's not eating that, mm. you know, she's having basic foods and that's exactly what we're having. So mm -hmm. for example, we're having a uh, chicken and the air fryer. Ours will have maybe like a souvlaki seasoning mm -hmm. and even hers will have a little bit of seasoning with less salt. Um, but then we're also putting in sweet potato fries, mm -hmm. something that she can eat. She loves the sweet potatoes mm -hmm. and broccoli. Or what about last night? We had uh, fish, taco. fish tacos, yeah. right? And and how long did it take? It was like minutes. literally some white fish in the air fryer. 20 minutes. And during the 20 minutes, I chopped up the tomatoes, chopped yeah. up the avocado. And for hers, I just put less seasoning on. Yeah. And if your baby is not into the seasonings, then you just don't throw the seasoning on. Mm. But it's just made me become more aware of the things that she's eating. And essentially our meals are dictated by what she's eating, mm. but that is healthy eating. It's mm. what a baby eats is healthy eating. Can I confess You wouldn't something? feed your baby McDonald's. No. You're not going to feed your six month old baby deep fried foods. You're not going to feed your baby a whole bunch of like, I don't know, unhealthy fatty foods because you know, it's not going to be good for them. Mm. So whatever you're feeding your baby is healthy food is what you're feeding you. Mm. You know, and, there's and, less and additives, so, there's less sugar, there's less sauces. Yeah. That's what we're eating. A whole food plan mm -hmm. that doesn't feel like a diet that fills you up mm -hmm. because when you're eating whole foods, you can get really, really full. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the things that people say to us, right? We, we mm -hmm. kind of give them some guidelines around how much food that they mm -hmm. should eat. And they're like, I don't need that much. I'm full. Well, that's what happens when you switch from eating a processed diet to a, a whole food diet, which mm -hmm. is high in protein and fiber. Yeah. And for babies, they need the iron mm. and the heme from, you know, a lot of protein. And so it's the same thing. She eats, it's the same diet. Essentially she's high protein, high fiber, mm. and we still feed her fat and carbs, but we don't, I really focus on ensuring that she gets that protein because she needs the iron because you can't replace the iron that you don't get as a baby. Mm. Like as all moms know, the iron is so important. So for me, every meal is like, okay, what protein is she having? What iron is she having? If she's not getting it from this, if she, she's having, you know, Topi, there's not as much, I'll make sure she gets spinach. And essentially it's the same thing that we're doing. We're having, mm. making sure the priority is the protein, mm. then the fiber, mm. and then we'll add in the sweet potato. She'll sometimes have, um, you know, whole wheat pasta, brown rice. It's mm. the same thing. So essentially if it becomes too complicated for you to think about, it's... think about what you would be feeding your baby, eat that. Mm. And it's, I'm not talking about the period stuff, obviously. Well, can, I was going to say, can I make a confession? The puree stuff is also I, really good. I smashed one of the puree things the other day. It was like, hey, wait a second. I'll eat and those mum mums, those rice crackers and those rusks are also great because they're literally like 28 calories it's, and minimal seasoning and sugar. So just yeah. go eat what a baby eats. And essentially that's healthy eating, but you can make it tastier with spices. It's because, you know? it's because we have these mental constructs mm -hmm. around like, around like, 
that's a healthy food and mm. it's a salad. It's like, no, like that's no. not like, you, mm. like the difference really, if you look at the difference between, let's just pretend it was a, it, it was a meal plan that was mm. for dad, for mum, and for a baby, it'd be the same thing, just different portions exactly. to meet the, the calorie and protein requirements of exactly. that, that individual. And if you're doing that, it's not hard. And, and literally mm -hmm. whole food eating and, and healthy eating is so simple that it's most often mm -hmm. the flavoring comes from some spices or some herbs or hot sauce, which you or use, some hot sauces use, or something yeah. like that. It's very simple. It's the, the, the cooking is going to be air fryer, mm -hmm. barbecue, grilling or microwave baking. Yeah. baking. It's just mm -hmm. going to be very, very basic. Simple. Yeah. People think to themselves and I, and I kind of talk about this inside of our, uh, our base program. It's like people think that, Healthy cooking needs to be like Fancy. master chef style. No, master chef style is not healthy cooking. It's the more <laughs> stuff that's in it, the harder it is. So anyway, keep it simple. Yeah. Let's move into the idea about how's your sort of mindset or awareness change? Has having a baby made you more aware, or do you think because your mind is occupied so much, it's made you less aware? Um, I would say overall, it's made me more patient. Um, and I think all moms realize that they have to be patient mm. and they have to slow down and they have to go with, you know, you can't rush a baby to eat her dinner because mm. you have other things you want to do. Mm. You know, you can't rush the baby to fall asleep mm -hmm. because, you know, when you do that, they don't fall asleep and the process takes even longer than it mm. would if you just let them naturally take their time and every baby, you know, um, sleeps when they, when they want to sleep. But if you try and force it because you want to stick to your schedule, that's mm. not going to work. So mm. I think becoming more adaptable, patient, slowing down. Um, and I guess that comes with the slowing down, being more mindful mm. um, and just, you know, taking everything in and being more mindful. I mean, a lot of the times when I do go for the walk, which, you know, you won't be able to see my step count unless I have my Apple watch on mm. is that I don't take the phone mm. because I want to be present with her. Um, or when I'm playing with her, I usually don't have the phone around either mm. um, because I want to be present. And that's something that for me, mm. um, and you would be able to attest to this because you're around me all the time that I would almost always have my phone mm. everywhere that I go. And now there's often days where I'm like, I have no idea where my phone is. And mm. I think a lot of moms can agree. You probably lose your phone more than anything when you become a mom, because you do unplug more. Mm. Whereas when you're don't have a child, you're attached to your phone and you almost always know where your phone is. So when I, um, when I sort of said, I want you to come on the podcast and have a bit of a, a discussion, you wanted to do this topic. And uh, why was it that you wanted to do this topic? Cause I'm, I'm thinking that it was born out of like a, oh man, I need to kind of prosecute this message a little bit. What, what is the actual message? What, what do you think is the main kind of thing that you feel that you would like to encourage a bit as a coach? I think it's the way you reframe yeah. becoming a parent. And I think it's the same thing. Like you talked about this the other day about, you know, last weekend when we had a barbecue at our house and it was a lot of my sister's friends. And mm. so they didn't know who you were. And, you know, it was like meeting people for the first time. And then you came out to go swimming in the pool and had your shirt off. And they said, oh, you definitely do not have a dad bod or that's what that's not what a dad bod looks like. And I think it's the same thing is that we have this idea that maybe again, it's like the story of where I was told you will bounce back quickly, that mm -hmm. I felt like I had to do that. But it's almost like you fulfill this prophecy, prophecy yeah. that people tell you that it's, we feel like it's okay to have a dad bod because I'm a dad now mm. that there's, you know, you kind of fulfill it in that sense or that as a mom, it's okay if you don't do everything. And then that's great. And that's true. You don't have to do everything, but I think you know, you do have to make yourself a priority because we don't see ourselves as that. And I think that's what hap has happened. I think the priority of like, the it's all about the baby is the prophecy that we're fulfilling. Mm. And it is about the baby. I'm not saying by any means to neglect your child mm. and to not give them the attention to need, but they need you. At mm. the end of the day, they need you. And mm. the answer here is you. Mm. They need you. So you need to take care of yourself so that you can be there for them. And I think if, if, the identity of a fresh parent, mm -hmm. probably more so mum than dad. Mm -hmm. If mum just becomes mum and she loses all identity of herself, mm -hmm. like that must be like a crisis for a mum. I don't know this firsthand, but it must be a crisis for a mum. And so I guess a couple of takeaway messages that we'd work towards guys is number one, please have yourself a little bit of compassion. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes you need compassion and I see it like this. It's an interval between compassion and discipline. Mm -hmm. Compassion is when you're up at this end and you're 
trying to just make it work and you're so tired and you know what maybe you just need to take a bit of self-care but then at the other end if it's you know a year on since the pregnancy and you're still stuck well you need to ask for help you you need to ask for something to either get you back into momentum if you can't do it yourself Mm -hmm. or a bit of a plan because this is where you need some discipline so you're always walking this line between compassion and discipline so that's probably the number one thing is reframing Reframing. the way you look at becoming a parent and help Mm. and that you can incorporate help it's i know it's hard but if we reframe the way we look at it Mm. and you see that it is important for you to make yourself a priority so your health is incorporated as opposed to being separate to being a parent yeah exactly and like i said the walks Mm. with the pram that is getting steps in she's happy i'm happy we're both getting fresh air. Mm. It's great. Mm. You know, what are you feeding her? Feed yourselves the same thing, but mm. add the spices, add the hot sauces. You know, she's eating that high protein, high fiber diet, and she's still getting the carbs, the avocado and mm. the bread that we still feed her. So it's a balanced diet, mm. but essentially we do the same thing that she eats. So she's kind of actually inspired us to come up with come menu up with ideas. Cause I'm like, what am I? Cause it is about her. I'm like, what are we feeding her for dinner? Okay. How can we make this you know, something that works for us, something that works for us. So that it works for the whole family. So you kind of get mm. a bit creative there. Mm. Um, and, and probably yeah. the third, the, probably the third thing guys is just being mindful that like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Mm. If you can get in a, if you can get in a 20 minute workout session or a, or a 10 minute workout mm. session, that's awesome. Like that's, that's like, it's this, it's this constant. And this goes for anyone on any type of transformation. It's this constant pursuit of the need to be perfect the black and white rules, Mm -hmm. which causes the failure complex Mm -hmm. that we just keep falling off. We didn't fall off because we failed. We fell off because we weren't perfect. Mm -hmm. So we need to just realize that the goal is not to get somewhere. It's not to be like, I'm getting there. And once I get there, I'll be happy because what you'll find is when you actually get there, you adjust to it really quite quickly. Mm -hmm. It's about who you are when you're on that journey. And so I think we can leave it there. Any kind of final things you want to say? No, I think, yeah, it's just reframe. Cool. Um, don't be too hard on yourself, mm. but just be able to have the awareness to recognize if it's really an excuse. Mm. I or, like it. You know, I like it. If it's a physical limitation. Okay. Uh, progress over perfection. I think that's a really good comment. So look, we're going to leave it there. We wanted to come on and do something a little bit different uh, today, guys, and have just a lighthearted chat, especially to all of those of you that are kind of younger parents, mm-hmm. as in parents of younger kids. Mm-hmm. It's just maybe a refresh was like, maybe I'm overthinking this. Like maybe I'm overthinking this. Maybe I can get a couple of sets of cheap dumbbells from Rebel Sport and stick them in the basement, do a couple of bicep curls when no one's looking. Mm -hmm. Like some of the times we kind of turn a a, a kind of, what do you call a, what do they call it? A a mountain from a molehill. You know, it just becomes something which is just overwhelming and unbearable and it doesn't need to be. And I think it's the overthinking. This is like you said, the overthinking with the perfection that if I can't do it all. There's no point in doing it. There's no point in doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, first podcast, what do you guys think? (laughs) She's definitely uh, made the appearance look a lot better to the podcast, Mm -hmm. which is good. By the way, guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please go to either, actually, I'll put it in the the section above, Apple or Spotify, and please subscribe. And if you do feel inclined to rate the podcast or share the podcast, we'd certainly be super, super inspired to do so. We appreciate you guys coming on. This has been the Better Body Academy podcast, the podcast you come to when you're sick of the dumb diets, unsustainable workout programs and feeling like a parent who's no good. Lift yourselves up, guys. Have a beautiful weekend. We will see you on the next episode. Wolves and Warriors, thank you so much for tuning in. If this podcast is hitting the mark for you and giving you the confidence to start your own personal journey, I want you to hit me up on Facebook or head over to my Instagram at jstewart underscore Better Body Academy and DM me with the words Better Body Academy. I want to give you the tools to permanently overhaul your mind and body without dumb diets and unsustainable workout programs. Our mission is to achieve 1 million lives transformed. And you, my friend, could be next. So hit me up on Facebook or head over to my Instagram at jstewart underscore Better Body Academy and DM me with the words Better Body Academy and we can have a chat about whether we can help you with your transformation goals.